Hello. I guess the microphone's here. <laughs> Welcome to the Heart of Fiat Crucified Love. I'm so happy to be back with you this week. It's been a bit of an interim, um, just with the busyness of the holidays and I had to work double, triple time for the family that I helped take care of um, because holidays just means more work with the kids, right? But I am so happy to be back here this week and we are gonna talk about spiritual reading and the ministry of my books. There's just a lot I'd like to share with you about that. And um, it's come some quotes of the saints as to why spiritual reading is important and kind of why I think that the Lord has led me down this path of missionary work. Um, so we have a lot to talk about. And I thought we'd start with a song. What was on my heart was um, Thy Word, right? It's a, kind of an older praise song, but... Um, you know, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And today is actually the feast of the presentation. It's February 2nd when I'm recording this. And, you know, all through through Advent, I did that podcast on light. The Lord was really showing me about um, how he is the light, right? And then through the Christmas season, and now here it's Candlemas, and he's still kind of reiterating that. And it's his presence that gives us light, but he is the word incarnate. His words also give us light. And when we receive the Eucharist, we become a tabernacle of that light and his presence. But also when we speak his words, when we allow the Holy Spirit actually to speak through us, then we are also light bearers to the world, right? And so as we pray that his word is a lamp unto our feet. We pray that also we may be a lamp shining his light and his word to others. And that's kind of the purpose in this ministry. Um, it's not something I planned out ahead of time with my mind, but God planned. And I just followed step by step. And, um, and in the end, look where we are. I'm going to share it with you. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us a fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we will be recreated, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Thy 
the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Sweet Jesus, please pour your precious blood and your Holy Spirit upon me and upon all those who join us in this podcast. Help us to hear the voice of your love and your light and to share that with the world. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So I'll tell you a secret. I have a podcast planned every week, and I just have been so busy, I'll get it planned, and I just won't get it recorded. And this week, the Lord said, Mary, just do it. I don't even care what you do it on. Just do it. I'll help you. I'll tell you what to say. And this was on my heart, but I actually have a whole big group of um, people coming over in about an hour and a half. So like the time is getting shorter. And I haven't played guitar since my last podcast. And I pulled the song out and I thought, oh, I don't need to practice this. I know it fine. <laughs> and I messed it up. So sorry. <laughs> but better that than nothing, right? I want to share with you so much beauty. Because the Lord is always sharing his beauty with me. It's just finding that time. Um to be able to do all of the things he asks of me to do, right? So you can pray for that, that the Lord blesses me with the time and the money I need to continue on the work that he's entrusted to me. But I wanted to start at the beginning here, kind of on that same theme as thy word, just reading the scripture from the beginning of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came to be through him. And without him, nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I, I just, at the beginning of time, what did, what's the first thing the Lord said? Fiat. Luke's, let there be light. It was an act of giving life to creation, right? So it was his word, who was God, who was life, who was light, and who was love. And the Lord in creating bestowed something of his own presence on creation. And then... Um, primordially on mankind, on man and woman, right? He was in the world, but the world and the world came to be through him, but the world didn't know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. So God created all of creation and man and woman to have this relationship with him. And what did Adam and Eve do? They disobeyed, they doubted, they didn't trust. And through all of that, sin entered in and their relationship with God was broken. And so, you know, the Trinity, I was going to say the Father, but it was also the Son, it was also the Holy Spirit. You know, they're, um, they don't give up easily. You know, there's that poem, The Hound of Heaven, you know. He searches us out and he prepared his people all these years and he came to earth and he took our flesh in the incarnation. The word became flesh. He made his dwelling among us. We saw his glory. The glory is of the father's only son, full of grace and truth, right? And yet so many, when he came to us, who were his own, did not accept him. And they didn't know him. The idea of spiritual reading, right, is that, you know, it, the most important spiritual reading is reading from Scripture, right? Reading from the Bible, knowing that actual word of God, right? It's verbatim, the words of God. And they give us life and they give us healing. You know, I've heard of stories where people repeat certain 
scripture passages and they're healed or they're delivered from evil or they're, they're, their fear is taken away and they're given courage, right? Um, you know, when somebody is overwhelmed with a task before them, for example, they can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things, right? And it's not just the power of the words, although they have power, but it's also the transformation of the mind and the heart where by meditating on these words inspired by the Holy Spirit, one begins to think like Christ, right? People, the world did not know him. Well, you start to know him. You know that what by saying those words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know that Christ is strong. Christ is love. We are weak, but he can enter in and strengthen us. So it educates us, but it educates our hearts. It educates our hearts in love. The love of the Holy Spirit that inspired those words of scripture fills our hearts and gives us strength in those situations. So scripture is very important to read and to meditate on and, and to ask the Lord, what are you saying to me today, right? And yet, um, throughout the centuries, the saints have also written meditations on scripture and other forms of spiritual reading. And, and they all agree that it's very beneficial for the soul to read um, explanations of scripture, right? And to meditate on them. Because one, Satan, what did he do with Adam and Eve? He, he sowed a lie. Don't believe your father. He's not trustworthy. Don't listen to him. He wants to take your power, right? But if he, they were meditating on those first words that the Father had said in the garden, fiat lux, let there be light, they never would have listened to the enemy, the king of darkness. They would have clung to that light. They would have said, my Father who gives light and gives life would not lead us astray. So it also changes our heart and it strengthens our love relationship with God. And it's interesting to see how God has used books from the history of, of even Israel, right? He gave the law of Moses written on stone. Those were like some of the first books, right? He took his own finger and he burnt into stone the Ten Commandments. He didn't just tell them. He wrote it. He said to them, meditate on this. Repeat it to your children day and night. So God knows that we're concrete. We need to see this, right? And it's not just the written word of language he gives us, but of images of love. Christ is the image of the invisible God. And he came to earth to show us his image of love. Written on his wounds. You know, the, icon, the iconoclasts who say that we shouldn't draw images of God, that it's wrong, have no idea what they're talking about because Christ himself left his first image on earth on the veil of Veronica on the way of the cross. She wiped his face. He left his face imprinted on that. The Shroud of Turin. Because God knows we're concrete, so we need books. We need images of his love. And over the years, the Lord has drawn me into that aspect of ministry. You know, some people he calls to, you know, run soup kitchens. And I've run soup kitchens, right? In Moscow was the first time. And yet my whole life is not given to that, although it would give me joy. When I go to homeless shelters or women's shelters or places like that to drop off donations or different things, my heart longs to spend time there. But I can't because I have a different mission all over the world, right? I have thousands of souls that I'm feeding Christ to through my books. And to do that, like I need, it's a place of prayer. I need a house. I need a, a center for my ministry. I need the funds to send this stuff. So I have to work. And I can't work for the poor because they don't give me money for the poorer people in these other persecuted countries. So I have to work for the wealthy. 
my heart longs to spend my days, you know, with the poor. So that's some people's ministry, but mine was what? It was specifically the Lord. He called me first to prayer. And I spent years doing nothing but praying. And I know that's what the Lord wants ultimately from me. And so at some point, he will guide me back to that. But he doesn't call us to pray just to pray. There's always an outpouring of that grace. You know, in the old Russian tradition, the pustiniki, the hermits, they then would begin to welcome people into their hermitage. They were called the uru, or the, um, the uh, staritsi, the old wise people. The people would seek out for help. When people had a theological problem, when people had to be educated in the ways or the love of God. And a lot of that I have done in different ways, but one is by writing down a lot of these truths. And it's ended up to be um, a, a work of, of both writing books and then the icons that I paint that are put as the images on the front. You know, in um, Nigeria, in the Muslim area in the north, sometimes they're transporting these books and Muslims will stop them on the street and say, what is that? I need that image of Mary in my home. I don't know what's in that book, but I need that image. Sometimes an icon can draw people to an understanding of God even more than actual words. My book, Out of the Darkness, does that as well especially to people in places where Christians are persecuted, where they're torched, where they're killed. The women who've been attacked and raped see this image of a tortured Jesus who loves them in darkness and yet giving his light. They say, I need that. I need to look on him who was pierced in order to pour out his blood and his love to save me. Jesus naked on the cross heals the shame of what people have done to me. That's what these women say to me. So it's not just the written word, but it's the books. And um, I have seven books now um, in so many languages. The Holiness of Womanhood I wrote when I was at Notre Dame. And it's on the dignity and vocation of women. And it's being used all over the world to heal um, men that abuse women who don't who see them as um, a piece of property to raise up a dignity and a love and a respect for them. It's being used to heal women who hated themselves because in their society only men are, are respected. It has healed women who did not understand their vocation of motherhood. It's made them into mothers, not only to their own children whom they would have aborted if they hadn't encountered this writing. But to these large number of groups of, of prayer groups that we have of children. In Pakistan, we have 800 children in our Children of the Cross prayer groups. And many of them are run by women, not all. But this book has been really powerful. And here I thought that it would be a tool in the United States. It's got a great, um, a great review here by Father Mitch Pacwa from, um, he founded Ignatius Press and um, he is from EWTN. He said it was the best book on women's spirituality he'd ever read. Yeah, people in the United States often kind of just pass it by. But in Nigeria, in Pakistan, in Uganda, in Ethiopia, in the Sudan, in the Cameroon, in Mexico, in Colombia, in India. This book is changing hearts and bringing a new restoration to womanhood. And, and um, it's being a bearer of peace to these places. So it's really beautiful to see. You know, I tr was trying to paint an image of the Maria Bambina and I did her face and I thought, that looks like an adult face. So I'm going to do it over. But I kept the face and I thought, well, I'll paint an image of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I don't really need it, but I'll do it. And that night I put it in my bedroom and it was glowing all night. Literally light was coming from it, like into my room. 
And I thought, well, this image must be important. I had no idea that this image is known all over the world as an image of Our Lady's purity and humility and the brightness of the fire of the love of God that comes to us. So it's really beautiful to see. And it's healed many marriages. It's protected many young, young women. And even the Muslim women really love this book. The next book that I wrote was Out of the Darkness, and it's on the interior passion of Christ. I wrote the first half in Russia, knowing it was for Russia, because there's such a darkness there. And then the second part is Meditations on the Way of the Cross that I wrote living as a hermit in a cave in, Mac in um, Spain. And I'm so excited. Finally, after years of looking, I found a Russian translator in Uzbekistan. Ekaterina, and she's working on a Russian translation so we can get this distributed throughout Russia to the people who suffer there. And then to the former Soviet bloc countries, to the Ukraine, to Belarus, to Georgia, to Uzbekistan. We would love to provide copies if the Lord will send us money and, and, and people to arrange that printing because they're bound in darkness. And I remember that when I was in Russia to see how these people were bound in darkness, um, crucified, but on a cross where Christ was stolen from them. They didn't understand. And somehow by meditating on the passion of Christ, so many like in the Middle East have been healed of their fear, of their shame, of their pain, of their divisions. We have so many Muslim converts through this book. So it's interesting to see. I just want to kind of give you an idea of what these books are before we talk about how God's used them. The next is actually about my work in Russia, A Heart Frozen in the Wilderness, Reflections of a Siberian Missionary. It's an image of the Holy Family in a Siberian forest. And um, it's all about my mission work in Russia. When they wanted it in the Middle East, they thought, I don't know why they'd be interested, but it has spurned such a burning fire in these people to be missionaries. And they've started in their own country. And it's just a beautiful fruit to see Russia give birth to peace in the Middle East. It's just amazing. The next book is In Our Lady's Shadow. It's the spirituality of praying for priests. It's all about Our Lady's relationship with Jesus as the eternal high priest and um, how we can enter into that and go deeper in a spirituality of praying for priests. My Children of the Cross prayer groups were supposed to be prayer groups for priests so they could gain a lot from this. And yet... Um, there's so many situations of persecution in the world, we decided to make them twofold. So therefore, um, they pray, they're supposed to meet once a month, but now they're meeting every week over overseas. And they pray for priests and then for persecuted Christians. And um, they also include in there the most persecuted, which are the unborn babies, right? That a lot of times little girls are killed because um, they're girls. And so, it's really beautiful to see all of these children um, entering into Our Lady's relationship of spiritual maternity for priests, right? So beautiful. Um, then here I was doing this live um, Facebook rosary and Facebook has just really blocked a lot of people from coming and, and they were upset. So I thought, well, I'll just publish a book with all the prayers I use and you don't really need me. <laughs> so it's beautiful to see Mornings with Mary and it's a rosary prayer book. But the most incredible work is that this has been translated into Urdu in Pakistan and into Dari, which is the language of Afghanistan. And in this book is like the St. Michael prayer, the rosary, like all these basic prayers, the litany to the sacred heart. Well, it's the first place in the Middle East that people are praying these prayers in their own language. In Afghanistan, nobody's ever known the St. Michael prayer in Dari. And yet there's people in hiding that now have resources that they didn't have. Imagine the supernatural power of praying the St. Michael prayer in your native language. And in Pakistan, they're using this book. They said that even the priests and seminarians were embarrassed that they didn't know all these prayers, these traditional Catholic prayers. 
And so it's being spread there. It's also being used heavily in Nigeria with the prayer groups and the children are learning the litanies and they're, they're meeting and um, it's very, very beautiful. Then the next book is Raising Children of the Cross, The Spiritual Formation of Children. And the beginning just kind of goes through um, Our Lady and Jesus in their infancy, their holiness in their childhood, and what Christ says about children in Scripture. But then about the spiritual formation of children, how we need to form them to be saints. And then it leads you directly into forming these prayer groups. Because we need to raise children of the cross. Children who know and love Jesus crucified. Because this world, to be Christian, is to be crucified in one way or another. So they have to be raised to be aware of that. And then Christ will enter in with his healing, resurrected love. But it's been a very powerful tool as they're forming these prayer groups of children to have a resource. One of my favorite chapters in this book goes through all the children. Well, not all, because I've read about more since I published this. Um, but many children's saints, um, children who were canonized even as children, to kind of show the kids you can be a saint even at age 7 or at age 15. God has a plan. And then the crowning work, I feel like, I still have to write. I have books I've, I've been asked to write, so I'm not done. But I feel like the crowning work of my life is this book, House of Gold. The Maria Bambina, it's a Marian consecration to the Immaculate and Sorrowful Heart of Our Lady, especially under the title Morning Star and Mystical Rose. Imagine leading all this army of souls throughout the world to consecrate themselves not only just to Our Lady, but to her infant heart. The more humble she is, the greater the Lord shed his, sheds his power through her. When was she more, more little and weak and humble than as an infant? And so we consecrate ourselves to her, even as an infant, as our Immaculate Mother and our Sorrowful Mother, as our mystic rose who kept all the thorns to herself and gave us only the fragrance of her love, the morning star, the star of the sea, who lights our way to Christ in the midst of a darkness. And in Pakistan, every year on September 8th, the feast of her birthday, people in that country make a pilgrimage to give themselves again to the infant Mary. And this year, thousands of them use this book to prepare their consecration. So it was very beautiful. So those are the seven books I've written. I've been asked to write a handbook of missionary life for seminarians. And so I'm hoping to get to that here this year, the beginning part of this year. You know, books can reach people in places that you can't. I decided to kind of organize all my mission work. My dad gave me some ideas about getting a notebook and writing some of this down because um, I get overwhelmed. Well, no wonder. This week I went out and I bought a hard notebook and tabs. And I thought every few pages I'll put a tab of a country and then you open up to that country and it says my contacts and what we're doing and just to kind of keep track because it's hard even to remember sometimes who is who and where they are. I have 18, 17 countries because Malawi has two languages. We are doing work right now. I'll just flip through these in Pakistan and I had to add Malawi today so it's kind of out of order. Um, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Colombia, Mexico, the U.S., Belize, India, Ethiopia, Uganda, Poland, Russia, and then the former Soviet countries will go under that, Cameroon, Brazil, Ghana, and the Sudan. Isn't that incredible? Here I wanted to be a missionary when I grew up. How could you ever be a missionary to 17 countries simultaneously? Through books. <laughs> through art, right? It's so incredible to me. And the people who get these books are like the priests, the sisters, the catechists who then go out to the larger group and they're all running retreats and teaching this. They're taking it into schools and spreading it. 
Um, so it's really beautiful because it reaches way more than the numbers that we have written down. I think in Pakistan, we had um, 6,000 books to Afghanistan, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So I think we've printed 18,000 books in Pakistan. In Nigeria, we did, I just turned the page. Um, we've done t almost 12,000 books. So that's incredible just there, right? That's 40,000 books. And these are given to people who then go out and spread this message. So there's a way of being a missionary, right? Here I was prevented from not having the financial support that I need from living the mission, the vocation I lived all of my adult life, which was one of prayer and mission, right? But so in some ways I'm in exile. I'm in exa exile as I'm a nanny to, you know, people in the United States the last five years. Um, I'm in exile from my poor people all over the world, right? But God has used that to have me set up something here. So through podcasts, through books, all of this, and I'm able to reach 17 times more people than I could just sit being in one country, right? It's really incredible. I was reminded this year, my birthday is on the feast of St. Hilary. And St. Hilary of Poitiers, he was exiled over the Arianism um, heresy. And he said in exile, he started to study and to write and to send his writings to these places to convert the Arianists, right? He said, although in exile, we shall speak through these books and the word of God, which cannot be bound, shall move about in freedom. So here, I am very grateful to what the Lord has given me, but I'm bound in some ways to Elkhart, right? If I wanted to quit doing all this right now, I was telling my dad this the other day, I wouldn't even know how. <laughs> it's something that God did to me and God is in charge of. I wouldn't even know how to quit doing everything. <laughs> So I'm bound in some way to this will of God and his Holy Spirit doing crazy things that I can't even keep track of. I had no idea I was working in 17 countries until two days ago. And I was like, no wonder I'm overwhelmed. No wonder I, you know, I can't remember everyone's name all the time. So even though we are bound sometimes, the word of God that we spread is not bound. And through books, it goes from exile out into the world. St. John Bosco had his feast day the other day. He said something very similar, and it's long, and I'm going to read it because I think it's incredible, and it's what I'm doing. A good book can find its way into homes where priests are not welcomed. It will be kept as a souvenir or accepted as a present, even by a bad person. You know, sometimes I can be like, here, do you want one of my books? It's not somebody who would sit down and chat with a priest, or it might be someone who thinks it's cool that I'm an author, but they don't really care what I'm writing, but they might pick it up then, right? A good book enters a home without blushing. If it's rebuffed, it's not discouraged. If it's taken up and read, it teaches the truth calmly. If it's set aside, it does not complain, but patiently waits the time when conscience may rekindle the desire to know the truth. It may perhaps be left to collect dust on a table or on a library shelf and given no attention for a long time. But then comes the hour of solitude, of sadness, of sorrow, of boredom, of a need for relaxation, of anxiety about the future, I would say even illness. Look at like St. Ignatius, like who was a soldier and off, and then he got bored when he was sick and he started to read, right? And this faithful friend shakes off its dust, opens its pages, and as was the case with St. Augustine and St. Ignatius, 
It may bring about a conversion. A good book is gentle with those that are hampered by human respect and addresses them without arousing suspicion in anyone. It is on familiar terms with good people and is always ready to make meaningful conversation and to travel along with them at any time, anywhere. How many souls have been saved, preserved from error, encouraged in the practice of virtue by reading good books? The person who gives a good book as a gift may only barely succeed in awakening the thought of God thereby. In most instances, however, the good that is done is much greater. Once brought into a family, if it's not read by the person to whom it was given, the book will be read by a son or a daughter, a friend or a neighbor. In a small town, that book may touch the lives of a hundred people. Think about in Pakistan where they gather these large numbers of illiterate women, women and read the holiness of womanhood to them. Only God knows how much good a book can do in a city, in a public library, in a worker's association, in a hospital, where the friendly gift of a book is much appreciated. It's a letter that John Bosco wrote on March 19th, 1885. I remember doing an interview with Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, um, who is, I think she's a dean at um, Holy Apostles, the academic dean maybe, but um, she was saying, you know, how she loves that ministry of, of books, you know, that I've kind of done too. She's like, you are having conversations with people who will live a thousand years from now, you know, and think about it. Think about when we pick up and read the writings of, you know, the church fathers or, you know, even the gospel, you know, um, or, you know, saints that lived in 900 they're having a conversation with someone who lived thousands of years later. St. Alphonsus Maria Liguori also said that books are very important. He said, as the reading of bad books fills the mind with worldly and poisonous sentiments, so on the other hand, the reading of pious works fills a soul with holy thoughts and good desires. The other day I saw a video of these poor street children like in Vietnam or something. And it broke my heart because a guy walked by and like bought in these nice clothes and bought them French fries and gave it to them and walked off. And I thought, how in the world did that man just leave these poor children alone on a, on a street, right? I mean, it's nice he bought them French fries, but man alive, take care of the children. And I said, Lord, I cannot reach all these children. And he said, oh, but you're educating the mind and the heart of people all over the world who will be inspired to go do that, right? They'll encounter your work and their hearts will be open to the work of God. Well, that's what Alphonsus Liguori said. They will be filled with holy thoughts, which save their own souls and good desires, desires to help others. And so that's why St. John Bosco said, only God knows the good that can come from reading one good Catholic book. One good Catholic book is enough. So what does my ministry do? I have seven that we're trying to spread to people who are hungry. This is not like, sometimes here in the United States, we'll have books sitting in the back of church and like they're giving away like candy and people will take them, but they never read them when they go home. Sometimes they do, and I hope they do. But these books are given to people who travel miles on foot. A woman in a wheelchair traveled a really long, difficult way to a seminarian friend of mine. And she said, I have been begging people to find me a book of Mary Klaska's. I was told you had them. These are people that are like burning with a hunger for what God is going to share with them. And so what God shares with them is way beyond the words that I have written on these pages. He uses the images and sometimes they say, it's just looking at my picture on the back, knowing there's an American woman who loves them, that opens their hearts so that he directly can change their lives or can encourage them. St. Philip Neri said, reading about the lives of the saints 
is a great means to preserve piety. If you want to grow in the virtue of being pious, to be inspired to be saintly, read the lives of the saints. Read spiritual things. St. Jerome said, when we pray, we speak to God, but when we read, God speaks to us. How humbling to think he wants to speak to the world through what I wrote in my living room, right? But that's why I'm doing it. That's how he's using me. St. Alphonsus Liguori said, without good books and spiritual reading, it will be morally impossible to save our souls. If people, that's why when people read the holiness of womanhood, like they convert from being pro-abortion. They can't go to heaven if they're murdering children. And so by reading this, they come to see their real vocation as a woman. Sometimes they need to go to confession. Sometimes their ignorance isn't a sin, but then they're educated and their souls are saved and they can save other souls. So when people say, why do you give books in Africa when they're starving? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Right? That's what Christ said. Sometimes there's things that people need that's greater than food. And if you can get people to read the word of God, then instead of me sending one loaf of bread, you've got a hundred people working to provide bread for the poor. It's actually more economical. <laughs> St. Paul of the Cross said, prayer, good reading, the, fre the frequenting of the sacraments, with the proper dispositions, and particularly the flight of idleness. These are, believe me, the means of sanctifying yourself. So he saw the merit of good reading. It's very important for the interior life and growth and holiness. Why should that only be available to the wealthy in the West who have bookstores galore? Many, many Africans own one book, and it's one of mine. In Afghanistan, if they own Bibles, they're murdered. But the Taliban hasn't figured out that my books have scripture. So their only connection to the church is through reading Pope John Paul II's teaching on the vocation of, of the holiness of women. It's, it's really incredible. St. Thalassios the Libyan, I've never heard of him, but he said, spiritual reading and prayer purify the intellect, while love and self-control purify the soul's passable aspect. So your intellect is purified. You come to have the mind of Christ when you read things spiritually, when you meditate on them. And even Padre Pio, who was less of an intellect, right? He wasn't like St. Jerome, he was pious, he was simple, he heard confessions, he gave very practical little advice to people, right? But he, he encouraged his spiritual children in spiritual reading. He said, help yourself during this troubled period by reading holy books. This reading provides excellent food for the soul and conduces to great progress along the path of perfection. Good spiritual reading can be a powerful instrument to fly along the way of perfection. By no means is spiritual reading inferior to what we obtain through prayer and meditation. It's just as important as prayer. In prayer and meditation, it is ourselves who speak to the Lord, while in holy reading, it is God who speaks to us. Before beginning to read, Raise your mind to the Lord and implore him to guide your mind to himself, to speak to your heart and to move your will. So the saints see a great merit in spreading spiritual reading. So practically for you here, we're going to go into Lent very soon. I encourage you to get some good spiritual reading. If you have not read Out of the Darkness, it is oftentimes people's favorite book. Get it. Meditate on the passion of Christ. Just dive right into Lent. I'm telling you it's going to help. It will, it will just feed you right into prayer. Last year or the year before, I tried during Lent a couple times a week to do a live 
um, Chaplet of Mercy and read some of these stations out loud. Perhaps I'll be able to do that this year. I'm not sure my schedule changes all the time. But get this book. But we're supposed to pray, right? We're supposed to do like service and alms and fast, right? To deprive ourselves of something that kind of purifies our mind. But we're also supposed to do almsgiving during Lent. Think of the great spiritual benefit that you could do to all of these souls all over the world if you made a nice contribution to the Fiat Foundation. You know, sometimes when you're praying for something, you can have masses offered for that intention. You can pray the rosary. You can fast. Those are all very good and important things to do when you're, you know, really desiring the conversion of a family member or you really, you know, need to find a good job or something. But almsgiving is also a form of prayer. I invite you to almsgiving this Lent and to do it through the Fiat Foundation. It's tax exempt. So if that's something important to you, I'll get you a letter. But you can feed this writing to people starving spiritually all over the world. In the Middle East, they don't have spiritual teaching the way that we have here. It's not allowed on the TV. It's not, this is all they have right? In the Cameroon, that's one of our big projects right now. We need $1,600 for a thousand books. We're going to do 500 of the holiness of womanhood and 500 of the children of the cross. The deacon that's working with me said that um, there's such a problem with the abuse of women and of children, right? So we're going to heal them. We're going to heal those women. We're going to teach the men about the dignity of their wives and children and sisters, right? And we're going to take these children off the streets and give them a job, an eternal job of prayer. It will heal them and it will heal their whole country. So we need that. We're also working on a Russian translation of Out of the Darkness. And it's $1,000. It's a very poor woman from Uzbekistan who is doing it, who can't afford the rest of her education. Um, so we're trying to help her. But then this book will be launched into Russia, like look what Russia's doing in the world. And Fatima, our lady, said Russia will spread her errors if she's not converted. When I look at the number of souls that have been converted by this book, I have such hope to think that it will be in Russian very soon. And it won't only help to feed Russia. The Ukraine that's attacked by Russia, they speak Russian. Imagine the healing that they can receive in reading about Christ in his darkness, giving them light and hope. It's just incredible. So for this Lent, I encourage you to do spiritual reading. I invite you to make it this book of mine. And I also invite you, but if you've read this and you haven't read another one, get one of the other ones, right? Um, March 25th is a feast of the Annunciation. You could do the Consecration House of Gold to Our Lady on her feast day, that would be beautiful. Um, but and not only does it feed your own spiritual life, but then you're connected to this mission in 17 countries all over the world. And they pray for the people connected to us. We're all part of the same ministry, the same spiritual family, right? Spirituality in a way. And if the Lord so guides you, I do, I invite you to make a donation so that we can continue to feed the poorest of the poor the food that will give them eternal life, right? It's that teaching about God. Christ came to his own people. They didn't know him and they didn't accept him. So we're trying to teach them so that they know him and inspire them so that they accept him. That's how peace will come. Because this isn't just, this isn't just intellectual material. It comes from prayer and it leads to prayer. There's nobody I know who reads my books that doesn't feel themselves drawn into prayer. So we're helping the world go deeper into prayer. And it's very beautiful. So that's, that, that's the purpose of spiritual reading in general. And that's kind of what we're doing with this book ministry. And I'm able, like, you know, St. Hilary, to, you know, reach people that um, people can't reach, right? A book can be snuck into Afghanistan. I can't. <laughs> so it's really beautiful. You can have conversations to those who are way out on the outskirts. 
and you can feed them the fire of Christ's love. And it's really, it's just incredible. So we praise you and we thank you. And we glorify you, Father, for this work. Mary, we reconsecrate this work to you. Joseph, we consecrate our financial needs to you. We ask the intercession of all the saints that we named and quoted here today and all of those that are particularly looking after us or the people who we serve. And we ask you prayers. We ask you to multiply this ministry, to open up the time and money so I can invest even more into it. We ask for miracles in that way and for fruitfulness and for all the future projects that you have. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Have an awesome night.